Buonasera a tutti. Good evening and welcome to the Italian Radio Hour. Io sono Viviana and I would like to welcome back our regular listeners and welcome any new listeners. Also, be sure to like us on Instagram and Facebook at the Italian Radio Hour and to subscribe to our YouTube channel to catch up on any past video interviews. Well, today I'm actually very excited to have our guests with us as um, for those of you who are interested in uh, uh, Roman um, history and um, combat life, uh, I will talk to Alexander Mariotti, who is an historian, a weaponologist, and a TV presenter based in Rome and London. He focuses on ancient Rome and Greek history, specializing in gladiator combat and the Roman military. But before bringing Alexander with us, a little publicità. Do you want to learn, improve, or master your Italian? Istituto Mondo Italiano can help. Located in the heart of Regent Square, Mondo Italiano offers small group classes and one-on-one -on -one private tutoring to help you learn Italian in no time. Visit us online at www.istitutomondoitaliano.org. Thank you so much. <laughs> what a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Well, uh, finally, we made it happen. Uh, technology yes. helped us uh, today to get together, to engage in a very interesting conversation about uh, your uh, field of expertise, which is gladiators. <laughs> Thank you so much. What a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Well, uh, finally, we made it happen. Uh, technology yes. helped us uh, today to get together, to engage in a very interesting conversation about uh, your uh, field of expertise, which is gladiators and gladiators um, uh, combat life, and, uh, and then also many, many other things that you're currently working on. The question is, I always try to establish the connection between our guest and uh, Italy. We have Alexander and then we have Mariotti. Okay, tell us a little bit about your uh, background. Um, well, uh, I think, um, as per my name, it's the perfect combination of two very different worlds. So on one side, I have the uh, Celtic side, or what we would call the barbarian side 2,000 years ago, uh, which is that I'm half Scottish and I am half Roman. So my mother's from Scotland and my father's from Rome. And like all good Romans of old, they were great travelers and traveled extensively around what was once the Roman Empire. So like many uh, famous Romans, I, I lived a little bit everywhere as a youngster. And that probably helped to add uh, to my views and, and sort of the way I approach history. And uh, what are some of the places that you had the, 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 the pleasure to, uh, to live in that might have influenced also your, your passion for uh, for history, Roman history? Well, um, I my parents loved Africa, and so I grew up a, a little bit everywhere in Africa. My parents traveled extensively over Africa, and uh, so my childhood was really spent in three places, which was between Africa, uh, Rome, and Scotland. Okay. So a little, a little town outside of Glasgow. So I had a very eclectic upbringing, mm -hmm. and um, certainly, I think, experiencing very different cultures and very different, I mean, completely opposite environments as a child, uh, probably opened my eyes a little bit more than it would have if I'd stayed in one place. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously between the Scottish accent and the Roman accent, you had really a mix of very strong. <laughs> I do, I do. People always have a difficult time working out where my accent's from, and I get all sorts from Canadian to, I don't know, it's quite funny because to Americans, I sound quite British, and to uh the brits i tend to sound probably a little uh mid-atlantic or but really my it's yeah it's a combination of of different accents put together unless of course i am inebriated if i tend to consume <laughs> alcohol i sound very scottish <laughs> um so um going back at growing up uh it looks like uh both your father and your grandfather uh your grandfather just lived around the corner from the Colosseum is that is that correct is my that... grandfather was born across the road from the Colosseum he was born in Via Capo d'Africa so mm -hmm. the Colosseum and it's probably you know this is a huge part of of my fascination with history is that and maybe where I, I tend to try and distinguish myself a little bit is that history, especially Roman history, is very personal to me. 
the Coliseum plays a part of my personal history. Um, the Coliseum has been in my life since I was a boy, since I was a baby, because I have pictures with my mother and my father as a child, you know, in, in the Coliseum or in the forum. I actually have a, a beautiful picture. Oh, I think I have it. I should have it here. I have a beautiful picture. Um, it's actually on my Instagram of me in a push chair and I'm probably less than a year old with my mother on the view overlooking the the forum mm -hmm. and then I have pictures of my great grandparents and my great great grandparents in the Roman forum I have some gorgeous black and white pictures of them so the Colosseum and and Rome and its history has been ingrained into my history there's mm -hmm. no distinction between the two really they're one for me um, and also, as I said, also your, your influence from your father, like the idea of my father to have fun and, in, and uh, entertain his children at a very young age and uh, grandchildren is to watch National Geographic's documentary. Uh -huh. um, so maybe yours was not as <laughs> extreme. No, 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 quite the opposite. I, no, I was, right. I was wondering if... Uh, well, my, my so up. so I was quite lucky because so my grandfather on my father's side spoke Latin, mm -hmm. and loved saying Latin phrases to you know which of course I had no idea what they meant when I was a child. My father, on the other hand, um, I I because my mom my mom was uh, my mom was a ballet dancer, and when I was very small my father used to take me around in a car and I just remember him telling me stories about Rome. So wherever it was, I think it was probably a way to keep me entertained because I was quite a rambunctious child was as we were driving through Rome was to point things out and tell these stories. And I just was always fascinated by them. In fact, I was, I was talking to a friend of mine about the story of Muzzo Chevole. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you know, what's interesting is that we were, he, he was saying his father did the same to him. And it's probably why he has an interest in history too. His name's Fabrizio. And he has this wonderful, um, uh, he, he makes statues, ancient Roman statues. Mm -hmm. um, I think his his name's, uh, his sculpting name's exem Exemplum Romanum or something. But that's where it came from, was the same thing he remembered. But it wasn't historical, it was more like popular stories. Mm -hmm. It was more like, like a sort of version of history, a sort of, folk version of history you know which is i think quite typical in rome is that we we get we tell these stories but they're kind of loosely based on history and they're they're more like you know embellished of, <laughs> embellished yeah 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 they, but it was enough to get me fascinated and uh i actually uh was able to find the picture in your in your stro stroller that is <laughs> <laughs> that's so yeah I that's had, me I there. Had yeah yeah that's me and my mom and I've got a I, there's another one of us in Vesuvius that my mom just found yes yes I did I did see that one there so, you go 1980 so I was I was one year uh, uh, I'm less than a year old there okay so uh from being just uh so to speak a fascination something that you grew up with um you now have made it into your uh career and uh, um, how did that progression um, evolve? And I heard, uh, I think I heard or read about an episode about you walking down Via del Corso. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Years ago. So I'm gonna, I'm, I'm just leading you to tell us all about it. <laughs> well, um, so I, I think I kind of ran away from it a lot because eventually uh, my father became an antique dealer. So mm -hmm. history's always played a sort of part. And I've always, again, grown up with old things and trinkets and little bits of history. And um, I still remember, I think I'm probably about eight, nine years old. And um, my father started, he, he was fascinated by antiques. And then he made it his business because originally he, he didn't do it at all. Uh, he was an entirely different field. And I remember him finding, I think someone had passed away and, and their family had sold, just sold all their stuff. And this guy was a photographer during the world, the Second World War. He was a photographer reporter. And just it was these fascinating things. And obviously, I think, uh, you know, the, the Second World War was kind of something I'd heard about and heard discussions about and sort of seen the, the remnants of. Because when we go to Rome, there was obviously a, a sort of a lot of the, the remnants left, especially in the area that my grandparents then lived at the time, which was uh, Flaminio mm -hmm. near the Olympic Village. And it was just, it was kind of fascinating to me that these things were real. They actually belonged to that part. And I had this almost sense of a time machine 
Mm-hmm. You know, that these things almost travel with us. You know, they 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 travel from the past to the future. And um, so my father being antiques, my mother being an artist, I think I didn't want anything to do as, as most uh, rebellious teenagers uh, tend to be. I decided I didn't want anything to do with the with history or art. Mm-hmm. And then I kind of slipped into art history by by sheer accident. In <laughs> fact, I have to say that everything I've done I've been very fortunate because it's been serendipitous. It's mm-hmm. it's been a, initially what I thought was a series of coincidences and now I think quite the opposite. It's been a very clear path that I've kept falling into and and now I'm I'm very lucky to be able to do what I absolutely love which is to spend my time around old things mm-hmm. uh get people interested in history and i've spent the last 22 23 years uh around beautiful places like the forum or the british museum or the louvre and um i i, I don't pass a day without you know realizing how fortunate i am so literally your road led to led you back yes. to rome all, <laughs> all my road all my roads road. led to rome yes yes <laughs> now in regards to the story you were asking about about Vido corso so uh, <laughs> i think people when they they maybe see my instagram get a little surprised because there's a couple of uh irregular pictures not the regular sort of pictures you'd see on an account that belongs to someone who does what i do uh, which is that I, I have a few pictures in costume. And once a year, by tradition, mm-hmm. now close to 20 years, I uh, on the 21st of April, which is the founding date of the city of Rome, mm-hmm. um, there's a parade in which uh, thousands of people, and they come from all over the world, uh, congregate at the Circus Maximus. And we have a wonderful parade that goes from the Circus Maximus uh, down around uh, where the mouth of truth is towards Piazza Venezia. And then we go a little bit around. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, and then we we come back and then usually there's a lunch afterwards. Now, what mm-hmm. happened was about 20 odd years ago, I was walking down Via del Corso and a very enthusiastic and excited gentleman approached me and said my goodness he said oh my god he said you man he's like you you look like a gladiator you and and I was you know I thought well yeah okay thank you very much and he he was like he was so excited I don't think he was quite sort of articulate with his words he was uh I, I can't recall exactly, but he's like, we have this, like, we have like a, a, I can't remember if he said a group or a club or something, and we dress up and, you know, it just sounded dodgy. And, <laughs> you know, and he said, here's my number. And he gave me a card and something. And, it, and the card uh, had like, you know, Centurion something, Valerius Maximus. And I was like, yeah, all right, okay, sure. And I thought, you know, I, I have, I seem to be a magnet for odd people like that. So, uh as, as the phrase in roman says tutti a me so but i went i remember talking to a friend of mine i said you know we're talking i said you'd never guess what happened some guy and he went and as i was telling him he says oh no no that's an actual thing i said what do you mean he said no no it's an actual thing and there's a museum he said you should check it out if they invited you that's quite cool so i I thought, all right. And I, I think after a while I went down and I was quite taken by the place. It, it, it was a bit rustic and sort of, uh, but it had a little charm to it. And I thought there was great potential. And I thought, you know what? I said, right now, I'll do this for a laugh. I'll do it once. But what happened was I really enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. And what, what also happened was, you know, in the way of, of, of being able to explain history, the more vivid you can be, the better it is. And and there's a sort of big problem, which is that none of us have experienced anything that we read in, you know, the numerous texts and literature, you know, I mean, when people talk about gladiator fights, they're usually talking about something they've read about and imagined in their head, but they're not talking about something they've seen. Mm-hmm. What I found that first day doing that parade 20 years ago was that I, fa- I, I found myself seeing things that I would normally have not seen. I saw thousands of men in armor marching down the Colosseum. Mm-hmm. You know, down Via Fori Imperiali, I saw crowds cheering someone dressed as an emperor and some were throwing flowers. I saw Vestal Virgins lighting a flame. And I thought, it's interesting what the mind picks up and what your imagination picks up on. You know, like 
I, I remember the glint of the sun on the armor. I thought, how interesting. I thought, yeah, it must have been, you know, and I realized it must have been incredibly hot to wear, you know, Lorica segmentatas. And, and, and all of a sudden I thought, oh, this is a wonderful way to be able to be more vivid and more real in my explanations of history. Mm -hmm. And that's also what got me into film because it was during films that I got to see things that I ne normally would never have seen in my life. So when I often explain gladiator fights, the reason why I partook in these things was there's a certain level of experience and knowledge that comes from wearing a helmet, using a sword, fighting with a shield that allows me to explain it far better than if I just read it in a book. Indeed. That is a, uh, and, um, also, it looks like there is a certain uh, discipline. I mean, you the the school probably gets um, ready for this parade. Um, it doesn't happen overnight. So people have no. really taken on this role and a commitment uh, to provide as authentic of an experience as possible. And yeah. uh, so there is a seriousness uh, to uh, to it. And, I believe I was actually looking into um, the school and they might have performances, but tend to, they tend to be more during the nice uh, season, like May through September. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, they do, you know, so what happened in, in the end, by the way, was that I actually joined them for a while and there was a museum and, and there was a lot of uh, helmets and weapons and so on built sort of exactly as the archeological finds that are in Pompeii and Herculaneum. And what happened was um, a small group of us sort of started working with this museum to try and work out how the weapons would have been used and using the techniques. And it's quite interesting because, you know, I came from a very physical background. I, I, I played sports professionally. And um, and so I wanted to, I, I loved continuing that sort of thing. And I'd done a lot of martial arts. And so it was quite interesting to put that into play with using the weapons because there were certain things you found uh, we would actually do, you know, we'd actually do the combat and we'd sort of use the techniques or try and get to the techniques, but also work out the functionality of the weapons and the shields. And, you know, there's certain things you realize that if you have a shield and someone has a spear and they keep, you know, trying to get towards your head, you've got to raise your shield. Eventually your shoulder gets sore. Mm -hmm. This is something, you know, that you find through actually working with the weapons and trying them out. And you, you say, well, I wouldn't know that normally, would I? So you realize, okay, so if my shields, I've got to sort of compensate. And there's just sort of knowledge that came about with it that I thought was quite quite interesting, and gave me a different angle than uh, the normal. Um, so let's uh, let's dive in into gladiators. Uh, first of yeah. all, who are they? Where are they coming from? Um, and uh, uh, was it a, a true profession? Was it uh, um, something that allowed them to have a decent a lifestyle or mm -hmm. as people might think oh they were just slaves and they were picked and because of so give us uh dismantle some of the uh incorrect information and sure. uh, uh give us some uh, uh background about who are the gladiators okay yeah well i mean the first thing we we often don't do is look around us and look at how things are today and then put them in in the past and what i mean by this is if you were to say to somebody, you know, imagine the same question you just asked me about boxers. Let's say we're 2000 years in the future and someone said to a historian, oh, tell me about boxers. Who were they? What did they do? The first thing we'd have to say is when. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at boxing today, boxing in the 80s, boxing in the 50s, if you look at Rocky Marciano and you look at a boxer today, heavyweight boxer, Anthony Joshua, whoever, they were entirely different, entirely different in the style, in uh, the rules. And we forget to do that with ancient Rome. It's almost like we get these very generic questions sometimes like, what was life like in Rome? And you say, well, when? When? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, in life in 100 AD was probably entirely, it is, was entirely different from 80 AD. As, as you know, look at the progression in the last 50 years life in the 1950s is certainly very different from life in the year 2000. I think 10 years makes such a difference. Imagine that in Rome. It did. It did the exact same thing. And that goes with gladiator sports. We're talking about, you know, a sport that lasted over centuries. And in the beginning, gladiators were entirely different from where they were 
when gladiatorial combat reached its peak. And I would say, you know, round about the building of the Colosseum, which we're finishing in 81 AD, that's when gladiator sports really takes off and it becomes a full-fledged sport. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about professional gladiators, they're very different than we imagine them to, but also because our idea of gladiators is formed by film. Mm -hmm. And a lot of films are formed by, you know, if you look back at the 1930s or the, you know, even the 1920s, they're formed by the cult, the sort of culture of the moment. Christian writers, for example, wrote a long time after gladiators. And they were talking about a culture that, you know, had been replaced and that they didn't want to come back. And so there was a lot of, you know, misconceptions about gladiators that formed out of there which was the gladiators were poor slaves and they're thrown in the arena and they have to fight for these cruel Romans, you know, who drank wine and, you know, ate while people's heads were cut off and, and they fought animals and, and that's not even close to the truth. And, and we're finding this out slowly, but surely because we've become more fascinated by Rome. And it's, I think it's probably because we've, we've realized that for a long period of history, we were taught that we were nothing like the Romans. The Romans weren't anything to do with us. And I think we've come back to realizing that we are the Romans. We are the modern version of the Romans. Mm -hmm. the, and this goes from many things. We live in cities of millions of people. Uh, that, that didn't exist 500 years ago. You know, someone like Michelangelo would have no concept what it was like living in a metropolis because there weren't cities of, 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 of over a million people. Cities of a million people existed in ancient Rome. In 300 AD, you've got 1.6 million people, close to 1.6, probably even closer to, to, to certain parts, 1.7 million people. When Rome falls, there is no city that size again until Victorian London. So living in a metropolis is very new to us. It's 200 years old. And so I think it's this understanding that we're, we're more like the Romans, that we delve into the truth about them. And gladiators are at their peak professional athletes. And they are not always slaves. In fact, a lot of people freely became gladiators, which surprises us. But it tells you a lot about the sport. And in many ways, what probably most surprises us is that when we watch films and when we think of gladiators, we think of people who fight to the death for entertainment, whereas the truth is that gladiators fought and very rarely fought to the death. In fact, probably 90% of the time, 95% of the time, the fight was was not to the death at all. It was indeed more of a, a, a performance, an athletic performance more than... It was, a, yeah, it was a spectacle and, you know, spectacular, you know, a show for the eyes. Um, and that's what it was. And I mean, there's so many clues that we probably haven't looked at for a long time that tell us this, that also tell us that gladiator sport isn't the most popular sport in Rome. I think we're more obsessed with it than the Romans were, because the Colosseum holds between 55 to 85,000. The Circus Maximus held 297,000 people. Mm -hmm. So the, the real sport for the Romans was, was charioteering, Charity. was chariot races. Yes, that was the number one sport. They liked gladiatorial combat, but it wasn't as popular as we make it out to be. Was it maybe related to specific holidays or uh, or maybe the emperor or, or or anyone that was able to put out uh, such a probably costly um, no, um, performance, maybe wanted to celebrate um, something specific or maybe show off their wealth, their power? Do you, oh. was, was there an association of uh, being able to hold gladiator games and status? Yeah, oh, 100%. And again, you know, the frequency of gladiatorial combat is different in different time periods, you know, and again, it goes through moments where because it was such a useful tool, because it was such a great way of distracting people and, and making people happy, uh, and because it was such a costly event, it, it took place in different periods. So if an emperor needed to win people over, if he was celebrating a birthday, if he just become emperor, what a great way to introduce yourself, then, you know, I mean, it, it's really, if you look at it from a political point of view, when it, whenever a new politician comes in, they generally try to win people over, you know, so they might give you a stimulus check or today, or they might, you know, uh, reduce taxes and they might pass some new laws. It's the same with the emperor. It, putting on the games is a great way of establishing yourself, showing you that you are a person of the people. 
<coughs> pardon me, but also showing how generous you were. And you're right, it was incredibly costly. So it wasn't it wasn't something you could do all that often because Rome obviously had a great issue with with money mm -hmm. because it wasn't like there was a limitless amount of money. And, you know, there was no silver. There's no silver mines in Rome. So part of the reason Rome had to expand often was to be able to get the money, to get to get gold, to get silver, to get the resources, to be able to maintain the empire. So something like a gladiatorial uh, uh, exhibition was a huge investment for them. So they had to be sure that it worked mm -hmm. and that it was successful. Um, I believe uh, you um, talk often about different types of gladiators. Can you tell us indeed how we would be able to recognize them, whether it was a different way that they were um, fighting or handling their weapons or maybe the way that their, um, uh, you know, the shields or anything looked like? Um, can you give us some insights in the, the different types of um, uh, gladiators? Yeah, sure, sure. So, uh, you know, again, there's so many... There's so many factors that went into making the professional sport of gladiatorial combat. And one of them was that Rome expands and Rome is involved in these great wars, but most Romans don't leave Rome. And so if you were an average Roman living in Rome and you heard that there was a war in Parthia, you know, Persia, Iran, Iraq sort of area, or in Gaul, which would be France, Germania, you wouldn't know anything about it. You'd hear about it. And one way to bring the world to Rome was through the amphitheaters, mm -hmm. was through the arena, because you would have men dressed in these very exotic armors, using exotic weapons, demonstrating the style. And you almost got a sense of what was going on outside the borders of, of, of the city. And so, for example, one of the most famous, which is one of my favorites, is a Thracian. Mm -hmm. So the Thracians are from, you know, today would be sort of the area of, of Bulgaria, for example. Um, they had a very particular helmet. They had a very particular shield. They had a weapon called the Sika. In fact, today in, in Italian, we say Sicario, right? An assassin, because the weapon was an incredibly formidable weapon. And if you see it, it's got a very odd shape to it. It's kind of got a little sort of hook, not a, quite a hook, but an angle to it. It's curved. And the sense of the weapon was that it was able to get behind shields and, and sort of get to the weaker points. And this was a weapon that the Romans had encountered in battles and then introduced into the arena. Mm -hmm. So for your average Roman, the first time they're going to see a seeker is going to probably be in the arena. But there was different types of gladiators. So when you get to, to gladiatorial combat becoming a professional sport, you would instantly recognize types of gladiators. You've got a Murmillo. Murmillo has a, a helmet called the Casas Christi, which is a huge helmet. And again, it's got, you know, Greek influences. So you've got the big sort of, the, the Greeks had a helmet called the Boeotian helmet, which is the big sort of open helmet. There you go. There's a seeker there. Perfect. Yeah. Um, and he was a, a scutari. So the scutari had the big shields, which are actually the shields that the Roman soldiers used. Scuta, the scutari were, uh, the scutum was about sort of four feet in height. And then you had the parmula, which was the smaller shields. And this was either a rectangular or a circular shield. So every type of gladiator had a different discipline, had a different style, had a different set of uh, armor and, and weapons. And that's what made the games exciting. Mm -hmm. Because you would pitch different people together. Now, this is a concept that, again, to show you how Roman we are, we've become obsessed with. Because a few years ago, you used to get boxers fighting boxers, karate guys fighting karate guys. But what's the number one sport today? Mixed martial arts. Mm -hmm. So Romans are the, the forefathers of mixed martial arts because they pitted people with different styles of fighting against each other. And today it's, it's the same. We go, how exciting. Let's get a grappler fighting a, a TIE fighter, right? That's what MMA is. It's all these different styles fighting each other. That's gladiatorial combat. But how interesting that we are one of the biggest sports in the world today is a small arena and two men pitched in combat. Mm -hmm. Which means that as we watch that, we could instantly take 
the, the millions of fans who enjoy that sport, place them into the Coliseum and there wouldn't be much of a difference. Yeah, indeed. Uh, was the uh, some sort of training school lasting? Uh, do we have any uh, documentation about uh, um, how long would a, a gladiator training school uh, academy uh, last and were they... I don't know, living on site, the headquarters, or they had a normal life with families and so forth. Any documentation on that? Yeah, yeah. So we have uh, what we called Ludi, which were the school, and schools worked just like teams today, like clubs. They bought, they bought and sold players. Um, they had talent scouts that went around and found people and said, "Hey, listen, I, I saw this guy. He's amazing. You know, we should get him in, or you know, buy him if it was a slave." And it appears that generally it would take about two years of training to become a gladiator. So when you went to a school and you were enrolled, the lanista and the doctore were the two fundamental figures of the school. So the lanista is the one who runs the school. He's in charge of the school. The doctore is the, the trainer. Mm -hmm. And it's during this time that you, you sign the contract, you, set, you make the oath, and you have two years in which... <laughs> they will train you and build you up. Now, this doesn't only mean physically training you up, but also something that is very relevant today in many uh, professions, which is a following. No, oh, okay. Oh, following. Oh. oh, yes, you have to have a following today, don't you? Yes. So social media allows us to get followings, but how do you get followings back then? Well, you advertise and you say, hey, uh, you know, we are going to get uh, Maximus Spartacus uh, Celticus coming. Oh, that's exciting. I wonder what he's like. Oh, he, he puts on a great show. Oh, now he's popular. Now you've got a good amount of fans. Well, now he's going to become headliner in the games. This guy's going to be fighting at this games. Well, I have to go see them. So building a following. But after those two years, if you had what it takes, then they would sign you onto a contract. These contracts tended to last approximately five years. And they mm -hmm. stipulated how many times you fought. And of course, there was how much you got paid. So there was a big draw to becoming gladiators because one of the, the sort of things is an average Roman, a, a yearly wage for an average Roman was about 9,000 sesterci. A gladiator, a good gladiator in his one fight could make 15,000. Wow. Mm -hmm. So you understand why people did it. But you also have to take into the context that most people are poor in ancient Rome. And if you were poor... From a societal point of view, there's no ways to climb. There's no ways you're going to be able to make it. So there was two options became available. Mm -hmm. One of the first ones was the army. And this is thanks to Julius Caesar's uncle, a man called Caius Marius, who changed the system of the army. Previously, you had to be wealthy because you had to provide your own armor. So it's interesting that, you know, the wealthiest were, were the knights because having a horse... You have to have the money to have a horse. Our concept of knights as nobles still remains today. In fact, it was prevalent even in the medieval period. So if you had it, it, guys, Marius made it that the Capitus Kensi, who the, the basically the, the landless poor could join the army. And then they would provide you with your equipment, but they'd also provide you with food. They'd also provide you with shelter, with clothing. Mm -hmm. And the ability to make money because during the wars, you're going to get paid, but you're also going to be able to get the spoils of war. Mm -hmm. So imagine for somebody who's at the bottom of society, suddenly your life has changed. You have the ability to change your circumstances. But that's 25 years of your life. And you might die before that happens. Gladiator sports, sport in general, was a way to become to, to change your social and economic status. Mm -hmm. And if, if you had, as most people didn't have educations back then, you didn't have an education, but you were physically built, that was an avenue that you could have taken. For, you go to a gladiator school, they're going to feed you, shelter you. They're going to pay you, which means that you have the ability to change your life. Still today, sport for people who are at the lowest part of society is a way out. Look at footballers, basketball yeah. players. The, generally, they tend to come from poor backgrounds. And yet, you know, you have people like some of the most wealthy people in the world are, are stars, sports stars, who have no education, but who have managed to change their social and economic status through sport. The same in Rome. <clears throat> 
Um, I have a question. It was actually <laughs> an article in an in a Italian textbook that I use for uh, <clears throat> lessons. And it's Antichi Romani, <clears throat> Verita e Falsi Miti. So uh, Ancient mm -hmm. Romans, uh, Truth and uh, False uh, Myths. Um, yes. And uh, one of, uh, and obviously this is a language textbook, so I don't know their sources. Um, and um, we have also depictions, a lot of depictions in Pompeii, I would assume, but um, they, they, they're mentioning the, uh, the gladiatrices. Um, uh -oh. And uh, <clears throat> so this is, this is what, what he says, okay? Uh, that uh, the, um, uh, the, the fights or whatever, or spectacles, the spectacoli. So the spectacoli gives, um, you know, room for interpretation, okay, with uh, mm -hmm. female gladiators were very frequent until in 200 after Christ, <clears throat> uh, after the disapproval of uh, the Emperor Settimio Severo, he mm -hmm. decided to forbid uh, women's conduct. But uh, anyway, his ban revealed to be um, not as effective as there are um uh, records, or I don't know what those re testimonianze, that's also mm -hmm. another very generic word, um, of uh, uh, performances, shows, spettacoli involving women. Um, yes. Can you tell us what you have been able to investigate and find out? Oh, this is such a, this is always, this one always gets me in trouble. <laughs> it gets me in trouble. This is, you know, so there's, there's a very big issue, which is that there's actually no term for a female gladiator. Gladiatrix is invented, uh, I, 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 if I'm not mistaken, it's invented around about the 1800s. Someone invents the name, um, but there is no term in Latin for a female gladiator. If, of all the archaeological finds we have, there's only two or three, and they're both contested, as to whether they actually depict women or or what they depict. So there's a very famous relief that it seems to say Amazonia and it looks like that it's a woman, but that women fought or were made to fight is not in question. Mm -hmm. But there is no such thing as a professional female gladiator. It, it's almost like, um, you know, the games had to be interesting and exciting. And so I think there was almost a competition to make it bigger and better. A great example of this is the Super Bowl. The Super Bowl every year has to better the one before. So you got to find ways to do that. And, you know, in terms of uh, gladiator spectacles, one of the ways was let's introduce women because it was scandalous, because it was seen, you know, the Romans, they're not, they're, they're a little Shock bit Victorian. Value. <laughs> yeah, they're a little bit Victorian, you know, and there's obviously very sort of uh, clear ideals as to what a man should be and a woman should be. And not that the men, not that Romans were shocked by um, women in war. I mean, you know, they faced uh, people like Boudicca, who, who's the queen of the Iceni, who led the revolt against the Romans in Britain. Um and, and they certainly, you know, they had goddesses who were quite bellic in, in their behavior. But, you know, for a, a woman to show herself, to show herself in, in, in nudity, too, because they were they usually had their chests exposed. And it was sort of it was it was sexual and, and titillating and it was shock value. Mm -hmm. But they were never trained professionally as uh, as gladiators. And mm -hmm. in fact, the poet Marshall um uh, sorry, I beg your pardon. In the, in the satires, they actually the, there's a mention of uh, a girlfriend um, wearing the armor. You know, this female. You know, she's ridiculous because her head doesn't sustain the weight of the helmet and so on. So he, it's it's ridiculing the idea. But um, I think we like you know, like many things, we like the the idea of it. But certainly, you know, we know that they would be pitted against. Uh, they weren't pitted against men, and they were. I, again, it wasn't a professional sport. It, female gladiators were not a professional sport. They weren't gladiators. They were almost um, a, a, not a sideshow, but yes, something extra. Okay. And then the Emperor Septimus Severus says, you know, I, I don't want to see women doing anything like this. Okay. 
Um, another thing also that uh, people expect in the, in the common knowledge of what a, a gladiator combat would be involving is also the use of ferocious animals. Uh, mm. Was that really, again, uh, uh, true or was no. at that point the Colosseum become in a way of showcasing maybe novelties that, you know, uh, yeah. again, animals that were not in Rome, maybe they were brought in, but not necessarily. Yeah, yeah, 100 percent. Well, gladiators didn't fight animals. So you had bestiari and venatores. They're, they're basically professional hunters. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, the, the hunters were not gladiators. You know, the, the Colosseum really comprises of three things, which is you've got beast hunts, executions, and gladiatorial combat. And I think later writers, especially Christian writers, sort of condense these three things into one. You know, that we get the, the, the misconception of gladiators that we have today is gladiators are poor slaves thrown to the arena to fight to death and uh, sometimes fight against animals. Those are three things. You've got to separate them. Beast hunters are professional hunters who fight animals. Condemned criminals were put to death in the Colosseum and various arenas and, and, and circuses. And gladiators are professional fighters that rarely fought to the death. So beast hunters were, again, they were professional hunters. They were usually from all parts of the empire that were used. They came from maybe tribes of people who were local to um, where that beast came from, who had, who knew how to hunt the beast and how to bring it. And again, the beast hunts are various things. They're a way to bring the far reaches of Rome that you're never going to see of the empire to Rome. Because when would you ever have seen a lion or a giraffe or a rhino, if not in the greatest cinema of its time, the Colosseum? Mm -hmm. you, you, you know, so, and imagine the excitement and the thrill and the fear, but also the the memory, the emperor that brought you, you know, hundred giraffes. Wow, what a, what a credible! I mean, who has that power? He's a living god that he has the ability to bring these exotic creatures you've never seen before. And again, it, they have to better each, themselves. So that's why we get these, you know, tales of the millions of beasts and so on. Um, but I actually what, what I find that the 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 uh, beast hunts must have been fascinating because when you go to the Colosseum, you see today there's only twenty percent of the Colosseum. There's not much visually, but when you go and you can see the hypogeum, which is the underground, you can actually see the lift shafts that, that you know were sparsed around, and they were underneath the sand and underneath the the trap. There was trap doors basically, so these lifts had the ability to pop things in in and out. The film Gladiator did a very good job of showing you uh, because they actually based it on, on the original, which was that you'd have a trapdoor pop down and, and out would come the beast because the cage was here. So the cage was here. And when it popped down, they'd open it. And so the beast could run up. But you'd also have trees coming out of the ground. So if you were in the Colosseum in the morning, when, which is when the beast hunts would happen, they'd have a full orchestra, music playing. And suddenly, whilst this music's playing, trees are popping out of the ground transforming the sand, which in Latin is harina, so the word arena comes from there, into a forest. Mm. So suddenly you're not in the Colosseum anymore, you are in the jungles of India, which you'll never visit, or the far reaches of Africa, which you'll never visit. You're there, that's what it looks like. And then a trapdoor pops down and out would come a lion, and then another trapdoor and out comes a panther, and your hunter's in the middle. And whilst music's playing, and you're with your friends safe, almost voyeuristically, you're watching this incredible hunt, which is what would take place in the far reaches of the empire. And when the animal was dead or the hunter was dead, because you could never control it, the trees would pop back down into the ground, you'd have sand, and it was time for the halftime show. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> um, so the if we can uh, continue the conversation, uh, moving on to the... Uh, the the series that is coming out shortly is that correct or I oh it's no it's out already uh, the okay, series okay yes yeah. so tell us a little bit about how it is structured and what we could expect to see and also the perspective that maybe was used to set up this series you see the perspective from I don't know the gladiators the perspective of yeah. people that who built the Colosseum. Uh, give us some insight uh, information. Yeah. 
So Coliseum um, was made for the History Channel. Uh, it's an eight-part series. Um, I, I initially was only supposed to be on, on one episode, and I, I sort of went on, and we started talking, and uh, it, we just really sort of clicked because there was so many. I found it very interesting, and I, I think I had a, a couple of different perspectives to give them because perspective is what really the show's about. Each episode is from a different person's perspective, which is wonderful because really that's what the Coliseum is. When you see the Coliseum, we tend to talk of it in a singular fashion, talking about the experience of the gladiators. But really, you've got so many different factions. You've got the gladiators, the spectators, the slaves, the people who worked in the underground, the emperor, the Vestal Virgins, the poor. There's so many different factions of society placed into one. And the series Coliseum which uh, is, is out at the moment. It's on um, History Channel around the world. Um, so you, wherever you are locally, you know, you'll, you'll be able to find it quite easily. Gives you it from the perspective of the gladiators. Um, it does have an episode on a gladiatrix, but what it does is I think is it gives, it gives people something to think about and to research a little bit more. You know, it's an idea of, of what could have happened and it's there to really challenge you know our our ideals about what a woman should be in society and and how different you know women's roles have been throughout history and then there's one from the emperor's perspective and one from the builders of the coliseum it's not it's not your average uh documentary because what it does really well is it has a great recreation and it's got some wonderful wonderful actors in it we've done a brilliant job i think usually when we we tend to watch documentaries of films there's almost like a parody. It doesn't seem real, but they've done a wonderful job of bringing these aspects of the Coliseum to life. Mm -hmm. And uh, it does a great job of being what, what the gladiator shows should be. It's, it's also a show. It's a spectacle. Well, make sure to uh, share share the links because I can a person can wait to um, to dive into the episodes. Uh, I'm sure they also enjoy having you for your knowledge, um, and uh, also you do have a quite extraordinary collection of artifacts <clears throat> that you've been collecting. Um, how did how did it start? And uh, uh, do you uh, have any idea of uh, do you have a number or <laughs> nah, no or a favorite so, piece that you would like to sh tell us about or uh well this is um yeah, this is something that's come out recently because i was talking with history channel and i was doing an interview for them and um someone said oh i don't know how it, i think it was just coming up off the cuff or something and uh and they said oh that's interesting and so they 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 did a little series of uh, videos uh, with me talking about these things. Um, I think they, I probably have, have been quite sort of secretive about it because it's been the uh, the bane of, of many of my past relationships. I've had long suffering um, uh, exes who have had to deal with, uh, you know, my, my choice of decor. Uh, in fact, as you can probably see everything like here looks like a museum. I live in a mini version of the British Museum. Um, it started by accident because I had a lot of friends who worked in the film Gladiator and as it finished, they said, um, and I was supposed to work in it and I, I, I didn't, um, do it in time uh, because I didn't know first of all what they were filming and there was a chance to do other, other films straight afterwards, but they said, come down and they're selling all this stuff. And I already wanted to make documentaries about 20 odd years ago. I loved the idea of making documentaries. So I went down and I bought a whole bunch of these things. And some of them, you know, um, some of them are quite recognizable. And, and I would take them whenever I do talks or sometimes I, you know, I do a lot of um, volunteering at schools and I do Roman days to get kids interested. And I love taking these things because they're, you know, generally when things are made in film, they're not made out of metal or they're usually plastic. So they're, they're sort of safer. Um, but it was always taken by people's reactions to these things. And I realized that a lot of these pieces, because they come from famous movies, people recognize them. Uh, most people have not been to museums, but they have been to the films. Mm -hmm. And so you probably find that you're, you know, averagely people have probably seen Gladiator, but have not been to the Archaeological Museum in Naples. Mm -hmm. It just happens. 
Um, in many ways, film is our Colosseum of today. You know, when you would go to the Colosseum to see the world, today the world gets beamed into our televisions and once upon a time into our cinemas. So um, I, have, I have a ridiculous amount of things, I know. Um, my dream is to have a little museum uh, near Via, Via Capo d'Africa, near where my grandfather was born, and, um, and put them on display. I was supposed to do an exhibition with the Colosseum uh, just before COVID, and sadly, because of COVID, it was cancelled. Mm -hmm. But I'm still holding out to do a little uh, exhibition, put these things on show. Um, but I have a wide range of things from helmets, weapons, but also <clears throat> props, little props from the films. And probably the some of the most famous are the ones I just did a little series about uh, with History Channel, which were bits from Gladiator from the series Spartacus. Wonderful. Well, Spartacus is a beautiful movie. Um, so um, actually, probably my favorite. Um, do we <clears throat> do we have to credit the movies for some good information? Is there any accuracy uh, oh, yeah. or um, that we can some that we can take, uh, or uh, have they injected uh, uh, just a lot of myths? Oh no, always. Well, you know, I mean, that's what. Uh, here's the thing. I I don't. I, I don't think you get a lot of these videos where you get, you know, people do what I do saying, oh, my gosh, oh, that's ridiculous. Oh, that doesn't work. You know, that's stupid. They never did that. I think that's very wrong because uh, I think that's really partially why I, I, I wanted to work in film as a historical advisor was to be able to shape the conversation as much as possible. So um, I, I, I'm very conscious that with film, you're making a story. And it is a story, and I don't think anyone watches film, and if they do, they shouldn't, and say, this is exactly what it was like. Again, look, over the last 20 years, any time I've given a talk on, on gladiators, which, by the way, my expertise is ancient Rome in general, but people seem to be quite fascinated <laughs> talking to me about, yeah, gladiators has been, <laughs> gladiatorial combat and the, the world of gladiators has become my, my sort of go-to. Um, but... Uh, over the last 20 years, whenever I've given talks, people always ask about the movies. And they, they, one of the most frequent questions is, you know, like, is Gladiator true? You know, no, it isn't. Of course not. But it doesn't matter. There's a lot of truth to it. Mm -hmm. But it's a story. And the important thing is that it gets the just of it. And it, it gets us interested. You know, one of the things is that, you know, the Romans are always bad guys. Mm -hmm. Every film you watch, every show you watch, the Romans are always the bad guys. But, you know... That's not true. <laughs> I mean, uh, my my opinion, the Romans were not the bad guys. Actually, Romans were were quite noble in their ways. Often they they were excessive, and they weren't always the the heroes. But for the most part, you know, they had noble intentions. And this idea, I mean, what what is the what is the EU? What's mm -hmm. this idea of Europe? Well, go back to Rome. What was the idea? Was the idea was that you had a unified system of laws and ethics and morality around the world where a lot of, you know, cultures didn't have anything close to that. And, and Rome really was the light in many ways. But, you know, we like to look at the Romans as the bad guys in films. So <laughs> films aren't historical. They're not documentaries. Um, but both documentaries sometimes have a little bit of show to them. The important thing is if you go away thinking, I'd like to know more, then they've done their job. That's the, the trigger, the, the curiosity, at least, and then yeah. people can take it to the next level based on uh, their... Well, uh, Alexander, this has been a beautiful conversation, and uh, I yeah. wonder if you can tell us what either you might be working next, or can people actually um, get hold of you to tour Rome or the Colosseum or any parts of the city? Do you actually provide that service? Yeah. So uh, I have a, a couple of documentaries coming out this year. Um, and I usually the best way is obviously on my Instagram account is I do tend to follow. I'm not very good at social media, which is painfully evident if you see my social media. But I do try and keep people posted and let them know if there's shows or documentaries coming out. Um, I do talks and um, I obviously I divide my time between London and 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 Rome um, and a little bit in Scotland. But you can usually catch me. I, I usually put up a calendar of when I'm in which pl certain places. So if you're in London, you want to come to the British Museum. I do organize uh, that you can book me for talks and, and walks. And uh, I love talking about history. So it's a pleasure for me. 
So yes, uh, you can find me for tours throughout London. And if I'm in Rome, which I am at the moment, you can reach out and um, I, I do have, I don't have a great deal of time, but I always try and fit people in. Okay, wonderful. Well, unfortunately, our time together is up. Il Big Ben ha detto stop. It is time yeah. to, uh, to say arrivederci e alla prossima. Uh, we want to thank you for tuning in to the program. And if you have any questions or comments, or if you have any topics you would like us to address, please contact us at the Italian Radio Hour at gmail.com. We would love to hear from you. Remember, if you or any of your family and friends have missed a prior episode or would like to listen to this episode again, please visit our website at www.istitutomondoitaliano.org and click on the Italian Radio Hour tab or listen to us where you catch your favorite podcasts. We would like to thank our guest, Alexander Mariotti, uh, our sponsor, Istituto Mondo Italiano, e alla Boara for the music. Until next time, alla prossima. Ciao, ciao. Ciao.